Hey everyone, this is Will from Youth Apologetics, and this week's guest was Father Charles Murr. Unfortunately, my introduction got cut out in the interview, so let's give a brief one right now. Father Murr was born in St. Paul, Minneapolis. He went to a Dominican elementary school and then proceeded to go to a high school run by the Christian Brothers. From there, he went to St. Norbert's College in St. Paul and studied Romance language, went to Rome to continue his studies in Romance language, and then eventually met a bishop named Bishop Mario Marini, who was an excellent man that he'll talk about in the interview. Bishop Marini ended up convincing him to become a priest, so he became a priest and served as the unofficial secretary for Archbishop Gagnon, Edouard Gagnon. So Archbishop Gagnon was the one who investigated the infiltration. So Father Murr is going to tell all the stories uh, here about the infiltration and what he knows about it. This is one of the most informative interviews. I had a lot of fun during it, so stay tuned. Thanks, and I'll see you next week. We'll do it without it. Okay, we're gonna. I guess we're gonna do this without image, right? Yeah, that's all right. Unfortunately, well, actually, fortunately for you. <laughs> I'll get a bother, Mark. Anyway, you want to call? Why don't you call AJ and ask him? All right, so go right ahead. Let's start. First of all, first of all, good afternoon, gentlemen, and if there are ladies present too. There may be a few. There may be a few. All right. Well, yeah, I believe so. We include those. Um, where should we begin? Uh, could you please give a brief, very brief overview of who um, Bishop Guido Marini was and who uh, Archbishop Gagnon was? Okay. Uh, first of all, we've got the wrong Marini. Okay. The Marini that the Marini that I'm talking about is Mario Marini, and when people would confuse him with Guido Marini or Piero Marini because there were two other Marinis, he would say, no, 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 I'm, I'm the non-Aryan Marini, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that's it. Anyway, his name was Mario Marini. Um, I met him in 1974 when he came to Rome. A very interesting story he had, very interesting story. He was the uh, oldest of three children, born in Ravenna to a communist uh, family. But I mean, really communist. They were involved in, in communist politics. The grandparents were involved. His grandparents were involved. His parents were involved. Um, I, I could tell you a lot of stories that, that go up to that. However, when he decided to go into the seminary to see what seminary life was like, he was, uh, I think he was 17 years old. He had just finished prep school and he went to uh, the seminary in Milan. His father found out about it and marched himself right up to the seminary doors, called for the, the priest who was in charge, grabbed his son, and told the priest that if he ever contacted his son again, uh, he threatened his life. All right? And when, you, when I'm talking about Mario Marini, Mario Marini was six foot three feet tall. He's no sh shrinking violet. All right? This is a, is a big man. Uh, he went home. Because he wasn't 18 years old yet, it was still under his parents' uh, rule. His parents sent him to the University of Bologna and insisted, just like his father, the father wanted him to get a doctorate in engineering, civil engineering, which he did. He got a doctorate in civil engineering from the University of Bologna. And after that, he had a sort of a coming out party, graduation party, where his mother invited all the eligible young ladies from, from Ravenna to their home for his graduation and you know the next step is now getting married right uh and at that party he announced that he was now he was now 26 years old he got his doctorate he announced that he was going into the seminary all right well that went over like a lead balloon right <laughs> you got it no we got well we have no image that's all I guess I'm going to keep talking while, while my able assistant here is going to try to get uh, my image on, which it's kind of nice that you can hear me talking beforehand so you won't get the shock of what I look like. <laughs> It'll come, you know, little by little, right? Anyway, uh, Mario Marini left for the, at, at that party, imagine this, 
the going uh, coming out, going away. Congratulations, you got your doctorate party uh, with everybody there present. When he announced that, his mother invited him into the kitchen, away from people, and slapped him, and said, <laughs> "Imagine this. This from your mother. Better, better." Una putana, for those of you who understand Italian a little bit or Spanish, as a daughter than a priest for a son. Okay. That was that was that was her reaction to the whole thing. He left that night at midnight for Milan, went into the seminary in Milan, and started studying. Since he had no financial help from his parents. <laughs> financial help they, they you know they didn't want to have anything to do with him uh, he got a he got a, a what do you call that a, a, a grant a, a, a study grant from someone who had who had uh, bequeathed some money some family money to the to the seminary and that person was uh, the Archbishop of Milan who at that time was Giovanni Battista um, Montini, who later on became Pope Paul VI. So Pope Paul VI, before he became Pope, paid for all of Mario Marini's studies, uh, sent him to Rome, and he got a uh, he got a doctorate at the Gregorian University in, in theology. Then went to Mexico for to teach for three years, four years. Came back to Rome, and lived at the Mexican college and worked by invitation of the Pope in the Secretariat of State. That's where I, that's where I met him. I also lived in the Mexican college, and we met there. All right, that's his story. So it's a kind of a um, a rather unorthodox way of becoming a priest. He had to do it the hard way against family. Imagine for his ordination and his first mass, no one from his family went. And they were only blocks away from the cathedral of, of Ravenna. Right, so that's that, that's that's his story. That's good, Pat. That's fine. That's fine. We'll just do it. We'll, we'll do it without image. That's it. Okay. Anyway, we're gonna do it without without uh, without video or without image because we can't figure this out. All right. We're old timers here. We don't know what we're doing. All right. <laughs> so that's that question. So that's Mario Marini. Mario Marini was a tough man, uh, no nonsense, um, pretty sharp, pretty sharp. And what he brought to his priesthood, he understood, he understood the radical left. He understood it very well. He understood communism. He understood Marxism. He understood socialism. And he understood uh, masonry, Freemasonry. And he never found them disconnected. <laughs> he never found them disconnected. They weren't disconnected. They all worked together. They had one common enemy in those days, and it was called the Roman Catholic Church. That was the enemy. And they were certainly out to get it. Anyway, that's, that's what Mario Marini was. He uh, kind of took me under his wing. I was 23, 24 years old. And I wasn't really, I wasn't really positive about what I was doing. As far as I was concerned, I was studying philosophy. Um, I love philosophy, and I love I love logic, especially Aristotelian logic. And I was studying that to go into as as pre law. I I, I wanted to be a lawyer more than anything else. And uh, in in my youth, you you know this wasn't so long ago, but. When I was a young, uh, a young man and a boy and a young man, all of the lawyers that I knew had a philosophy degree, and they knew logic. I can guarantee you, they don't study that today. Nobody knows logic. Nobody, knows, especially lawyers, they go on sentiment a lot. Anyway, that's it. that's it. So when I met Mario Marini, my life changed uh, radically. <laughs> changed radically. And it was fantastic to have this man. I think he, he was 13 or 14 years older than I, as, as he was a, a belated vocation to get into priesthood. 
because of the rigmarole that he had to go through. To, he, had, he had to get a doctorate in, in civil engineering to be able to start uh, to, to study for the priesthood. So there was a difference between us. And I, as you read in sort of in a, a biographical uh, sketch that you gave before, I'm the oldest of seven children, actually eight, one died in infancy. But uh, I always, uh, I guess I always craved having an older brother. I never, which I, yeah, I never had. And I always gravitated toward older people for friends. I, I enjoyed their company. I enjoyed their wisdom. I enjoyed uh, experiences that they had that I didn't have. And uh, so I found uh, great solace in his friendship. And he wrote his doctoral dissertation in the Gregorian University on friendship. Mario Marini. So it was, it was fantastic. We had a lot in common and we even had the theme of friendship in common. Anyway, I'm talking too much. You, you talk. No, it's all good. Uh, it's all good, eh? All right. Yeah, so please keep going. Right. We're, we're like, we love these. Yeah, this is most of what, uh, yeah, this is the best part is the other people talking. <laughs> is that right? You find that, you find that comforting, do you? Yeah, because... I find when, it better when you talk. Well, <laughs> when I'm asking a question, I'm worried that the question is going to be stupid. Um, <laughs> well, as far as, as, as far as it goes with me, there is no such thing, and I mean that. There is no such thing. And look, I'm talking about, I'm talking about different times other than your times and using maybe a little bit of a different vocabulary to, to, to talk about and describe things. So if you have questions, it's only logical that you would have questions. So don't worry about asking them, all right? Cool, cool. And if I don't make sense all of a sudden, remember I'm 70 years old. <laughs> it happens, it happens in the best of families. <laughs> okay, so what else would you like to know? Uh, could you give us a like little back, like a small background of Archbishop Gagnon, and then tell us about? Uh, let's cut right to the chase and get to Paul the Sixth ordering him to do the investigation into the Vatican. Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote I wrote a book called The Godmother. All right, and and uh, let me just let me just explain that briefly. I'm also writing another book, and, and don't let me forget to talk about it. And I'm not plug, it's not a plug. I'm, I'm really not plugging books here. I don't care if anybody buys my books. That's not the idea, all right? But I'm writing another book on the death of John Paul I, right? And just, just what I know from the circumstances surrounding that amazing death, all right? Um, I don't think it was any accident, and I and I I I know what I know what happened. I know what happened. So let me start with Cardinal. Let me start with this: the Godmother that I wrote is a book about my relationship, friendship uh, with Mother Pascalina. Who is Mother Pascalina? Mother Pascalina is a German. Was a German nun. As a matter of fact. She would correct me right there. She was a Bavarian nun, all right? My, my, my people are also from Bavaria, my father's side. And we were never Germans. We were Bavarians. Right? They came over when, they, when it was Bavaria. She was from Bavaria. Um, she was called to the nunciatur in Munich when Eugenio Pacelli, who later on becomes Pius XII. This is Pius XII as a young man, was sent as nuncio to Bavaria. Then he was sent as nuncio to Germany. This is right, right at the time of, of, of Adolf Hitler coming into power, right? Very touchy times, very difficult times. Um, there, are, there have been several books written against the Pope Pope Pius XII against Eugenio Pacelli, uh, saying that he was, uh, one was called Hitler's Pope, if you can imagine. So, what, it's, almost, it's almost blasphemous, the title. It's as, as, if, as if Pope Pius XII was uh, in league with Adolf Hitler. It's, it's, it's outrageous. This is outrageous, outrageous. Anyway, 
the, since he arrived as Nuncio, and I think he was, I don't know if he was 40 years old at that time, Nuncio to Bavaria, this Bavarian nun was in charge of taking care, she was in charge of the Nunciatur, the, 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 the embassy. The Vatican started what, it, what we would call the diplomatic corps and diplomatic service was really begun by the Vatican uh, nine or, or, uh, nine or 900 or, or 1,000 years ago, even more than that. When the Pope would send out ambassadors to, to the King of France, to the King of Spain, to England, to this, that, and the other thing, these ambassadors were called nuncios, N-U-N-C-I-O-S, nuncios, which means an announcer from Latin, right? So all of the ambassadors in the world are called ambassadors, except the ambassador from the Holy See or the ambassador from the Vatican. He is called a nuncio, right? <clears throat> anyway, uh, when Eugenio Pacelli was called by Pope Pius XI, and these are the, these are the, the pre-war days of World War II, was called to Rome to become Secretary of State. Why was he called to become Secretary of State? Because Pope Pius XI recognized that he had a genius in Eugenio Pacelli, and, he, and the man was. He was an absolute genius. He was a diplomat. But one, one thing I'd like to underscore for you young people especially, he was above all a saint. He, he lived a saintly life, right? Now that's hard to, that's, in today's world, that's hard to fathom because you're talking about diplomats and politics and this, that, and the other thing, and you, you're lumping everybody into sort of one bunch of, of, of hypocrites, backstabbers, of this, that, and the other. To maintain, <laughs> to maintain yourself, your own integrity, and to live a life before God of grace is no easy thing. He did that. He did that and always represented the church wisely and worthily. Through all of the years since Munich all the way to the Vatican, and then he was elected Pope, and he took the name Pius, and he was the 12th man to take the name Pius, so he was Pius the 12th. That was in 1939, he was elected Pope. Mother Pasqualina, or Sister Pasqualina, was with him as private secretary, she and two other sisters, and as uh, and took care of the took care of the of the arrangements of the of the papal house. So this woman knew Eugenio Pacelli, Pius the Twelfth, inside and out. She knew exactly who he was, how he thought, what his tastes were, what his tastes were not, how he reacted, everything. She knew everything about him, and she also realized that she was living with a saint. She, she knew that. It was fantastic. So she, she was with him for 40 years, 40 years, and in a great deal of Catholic and European and world history. These were colossal times, tremendous times. Uh, and, the, and the Holy See, the Holy See is another term for the Vatican, right? The Holy, it's called the Holy See, the See of Peter. Right, uh, the Holy See was in diplomatic relations, trying to negotiate with these, with those, to bring peace to the world in any way they could. During World War II, over a quarter of a million Jews thanked Pope Pius the Twelfth for getting them out of situations that would have cost them their lives. The Pope gave permission for for baptismal certificates to be falsified. Imagine this, falsifying baptismal certificates so that these Jews could have baptismal certificates and claim that they were Germans or Poles or what have you and not Jewish to be able to, to get out of the country. The permission was given for that. They said the Pope didn't do enough. This is, this is the claim today by liberalism. He didn't do enough. Well, first of all, to, to help the Jews during World War II from Hitler. First of all, he did more than anybody else did. He did more than Churchill did. He did more than President Roosevelt did. He did more than anybody else did to save the Jews. 
No one did as much as he did. And he also sacrificed an awful lot to help them, right? They, there, was a, there was a time in Rome when the Nazis invaded Rome, they took over Rome. It was at like 1940, I want to say 1940, 43. They took over Rome and the only thing that was operating outside of their control was the Vatican. Why? Because it had diplomatic immunity. Vatican City is its own nation. Therefore, the Nazis couldn't go into it. You should see a movie if you get a chance and you'd be entertained by it, by a great actor, uh, 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 Gregory Peck plays the, the lead role, The Scarlet and the Black. If you get a chance to see we're it. We're big fans of that movie in this uh, group. You're what? We love we're, this we're movie. Huge, we love that movie. Huge fan. Oh, perfect, perfect. We, yeah, we talked about that with uh, Archbishop Brolio. Uh, Who's the uh, Bishop for Military Services. Yeah. Oh, yeah excellent. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, that, that, that priest, Father Flanagan, uh, I think it's Flanagan? O'Flaherty. 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 Right? Yeah. Was, was brilliant. But he was one of many people who were working in the Pope's name to help save the Jews. There was, the, when, the, when, the, when the Germans came in, imagine this, they demanded 100 kilos of gold, 100 kilos of gold to be given within a, I don't know, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what period of time, but it was a matter of days. 100 kilos of gold or the Jews of Rome would be taken and put in boxcars and, uh, and off to concentration camps. Pius XII did everything he could. He told any priest who had any access to, to, to gold, uh, a gold chalice, a, a gold ring, gold anything, to melt it down, to give it in collection. And when they paid that, the persecution of the Jews still continued. And Pius XII opened up Vatican City. And you have to re remember something else. There are other extraterritorial places in Rome that belong to the Vatican. There's St. Peter's Basilica, the four basilicas, the four major basilicas, St. Peter's, St. Paul's, St. John, St. Paul's outside the wall, St. John and St. Mary Majors. Those four basilicas were open to all of the Jews and they're diplomatic territory. So nobody, none of the Germans could go into them. All of the convents and monasteries in the city of Rome were to be opened to any Jews, any Jews, and Jewish families, complete families moved in. Now, after you do that, so that they would be free from the, from the Germans, after you do that, remember, you've got to feed these people. <laughs> it's, it's one thing to open your doors and say, come in. Now it's another thing to feed them. There were health problems. There were, there were, there were women having babies. I mean, this is humanity uh, uh, in action. So how do you feed them? And I asked Mother Pasqualina, well, how, what, what did the Pope do to feed them? Where did you get? There wasn't food. The Romans didn't have food. And the food came in shipments of grain from Spain, from General Franco. He sent ships of, of grain to Civita Vecchia, which is the Vatican seaport, also diplomatic, in, in right outside of Rome. And those shipments of grain were turned into bread, and that's how they fed, fed these people. All right, this is amazing. None of this, none of this is in history books, because you're not supposed to think that Franco did anything nice. He was a horrible, horrible man, right? <laughs> right. Well, he did, he did what the Pope asked him to do, and he did. So the Jews there owned that. The Castel Gandolfo, the Pope's summer residence, was filled to capacity with Jewish families. When the war was all over and finished, the Jewish community, the Jewish people of Rome rebuilt Castel Gandolfo in thanksgiving to the Pope for saving their lives. And one last thing, and all of this I know from, from Mother Pascalina, but you, you can find it also written in, in, in some books. The Jewish rabbi, the head rabbi of Rome, after the war, converted to Catholicism, he and his family, and he took the name Eugenio as his baptismal name in, in gratitude to the Pope 
All right. So this is when they tell you that Pope Pius the Twelfth hated Jews and he and he and he was working with Hitler to eliminate Jews. I, you know, it, it's so outrageous. It's it's so outrageous a lie. You don't even know where to begin. But you can tell them from me that they're full of, let's call it poppycock. Huh? Anyway, that's that's that. So this woman, Mother Pasqualina, Sister Pasqualina, uh, when when she when she started to work in the Vatican, when she arrived as the Pope's secretary in the Vatican, all of the Monsignori in the Vatican started calling her Mother Pasqualina. Right? This is a this is typical of of the Latins and typical of. There's a, there's a word you should learn. It's a very good word. Uh, it's called, it, it's, it refers to a Roman spirit, having a Roman spirit, a diplomatic spirit, a, a savoir faire, know what to do, how to say things in Rome. And it's called Romanita. Romanita, right? He, if you have Romanita, you understand how to ask a question without asking a question how to say no without saying no, <laughs> all of these things. It's fantastic. To, the, the acrobatics are, are fantastic when you, when you see it in action. Well, the, the Romans who were working in the Roman Curia gave her the title mother. They, they promoted her. And when she protested that to the Pope, she said, all of these men are calling me mother, Mother Pasqualina, as if I'm the mother superior of, of my order or something. She said, I'm a sister. And then the Pope said to her, don't you worry. She, he said, were you a man? By now I would have had to make you a, a Monsignor. He said, consider yourself a, a, a woman Monsignor. Take the title and run. Anyway, that was it. So this woman, Mother Pasqualina, I met with her uh, at least two times a month, sometimes more. And uh, we became very, very close friends, very good friends. And she told me a lot of, a lot of the stories of what was happening in the Vatican at the time when she was there. Um, very interesting stuff. And this is all, keep this in mind uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to, if you find this interesting. I find it interesting because it's historical, <clears throat> excuse me, it's historical also because it's, it's part of my life and, the, and a, great, a great part of my life. This is all the preface to the Second Vatican Council, to what happened in the Second Vatican Council, and to what you're living right now in the Catholic experience, which is utter confusion. I, I, don't, I, I don't envy you. I, do not, I really don't, young man. I don't envy you because these are difficult times. They're really difficult times. And what I think I'd like to do, if I could do anything, is inspire you to know, not just know your faith, you have to know your faith. You have to know some theology. You have to. This is where this is where you have been cheated so tremendously. You have no idea. You have no idea how you've been cheated in your education. I can guarantee it. And I don't have to know your education, unless you were homeschooled by brilliant people, and by good, 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 devout Catholics. Then, I'll, then I'll, there's an exception. But if you went through a Catholic school system for the last for the last I don't know three generations, forget it, forget it, outrageous, they, it, yeah, outrageous. Anyway, I'd like you to know some of the history. Now, why is Mother Pasqualina important? Because she knew the history and she knew the players who were going to be in that council. She knew them very well, as a matter of fact. She knew who was who and what was what. They had many people that she was leery of let me just put this to, to you. The Second Vatican Council, they talk about Pope John the 23rd. Pope John the 23rd was elected when Pope Pius the 12th died. Pope Pius the 12th died in 1958. That's correct. I think it's 1958. My gosh, I should know that by better than my own name. I'm embarrassed. I think it was nine, it was it was in November of November of 1958. Uh, when he died. The man elected after him was Roncalli, was his last name, and he became John the 23rd. John the 23rd, uh, it said, went to the window and opened the window and said, what the church needs is fresh air. 
the church needs fresh air. And he opened the window and said, we're opening the window to change. Oh, October, October 9, 1958. Thank you very much, Mateo. <laughs> very good. And, and, and Mateo, I, uh, ex accept my apology. I should know that better than my own name. This is outrageous. I'm here, I'm telling you all about him and I don't even know the, the, his, his vital dates. Anyway, uh, when John the 23rd announced the council, he decided he was going to open a, the, a second Vatican council. What was the first Vatican council? The first Vatican council happened in the 1870s and it gave us, among other things, uh, the, the dogma of papal infallibility and everything else. That's a, that's a whole nother thing. So the second Vatican council, what he wanted was what he called in Italian aggiornamento, up to date, bringing things up to date. So what they were saying is that the church was so behind the times. The church wasn't behind the times, believe me. As a matter of fact, the church was in front of the times. The church at that time was, if you can imagine, if you can imagine a linebacker looking right at you and not willing to move a fraction of an inch and saying, I dare you, try, try to tackle me, try to get by me. This was the Catholic Church sitting and the enemy was communism at that time. You know that the enemy of the church just keeps changing names, right? <laughs> they just, from the beginning, from the beginning of the church until now, it just, they were called Arians, they were called Lutherans, they were called this, they were called that, they were called, it, they just keep changing names, but it's the same game. It's the same game, right? Uh, the, the point is that when the Vatican Council began, something happened before. There was a preparation to the Vatican Council, and the preparation to the Vatican Council was done by Pope Pius XII. He wanted to call a Vatican Council. He, the, this Pope Pius wanted a Vatican Council to, first of all, close the, the first Vatican Council, which was never closed, proper Italian uh, revolution, and then to have some necessary changes that he wanted brought about. Simple changes, not, nothing complicated or complex. Certainly, certainly not a new mass, okay? Certainly not that. But at any rate, for years, this was under study. So when Pope John the 23rd announced a new council, well, he had most of the work done. Most of the work was already done. When they got into the council, I think you, you probably know if you're, if you're like-minded and if you're calling me to talk to you, you I, I, I think there's hope for you for being like-minded. <laughs> I joke a little bit, but not too much. Uh, to just know this, There were a lot of shenanigans going on during that council. And a lot of those shenanigans came from Germany and came from Holland, the Netherlands, where they, the Belgium, where they found themselves more advanced, if you will, in different things about the church. They had a different view of the church. And when they came together with all the bishops of the world in the Second Vatican Council, uh, they put together a council, which if you read, if you read the council documents, they're okay. I, I had to study them in theology. We all had to study them. Do you notice a lack of, of enthusiasm on my part? They're, they're okay. They're okay. Uh, they're okay. There are some things I would take uh, issue with, but in the long run, they're okay. The problem was that purposely, some things in that council were written and left in, in an ambiguous state. Ambiguity was the, uh, was the key. Because if you, do, if you don't write things clearly, then you're open to interpreting them later on your own way. What you might not be able to get passed by 2,800 bishops in a vote, 
Later on, you can. You can go back and look at this line or that line or this paragraph and say, well, this really means that. You, don't, you didn't have to suffer through this. I did. I was sick and tired of hearing the spirit of Vatican II, the spirit of Vatican II, the spirit of Vatican II. It just, but good Lord. And I kept saying, even to professors in theology, what, but excuse me, what does it say? What do you mean, the spirit? Tell me what it says. I'll figure out the spirit. Right? But tell me what it says. Teach me what it says. Could it mean anything other than this? And many things could mean other than this. That was the problem. Many things were sort of open to your idea of your interpretation of things. Kind of so, dangerous. Um, kind of dangerous. Yeah. Father Mayor, uh, I, I have a, a question while you're on this. So, um, uh, I, uh, so do you think that the Second Vatican Council documents could be interpreted in a conservative way by your own interpretation, not like the only interpretation that's nonsense, but do you think at face value at all, do you think they could, or well, like with a preset interpretation, is there any way they could be uh, interpreted um, orthodox, or do you think that it's impossible to interpret saying something like Buddhists uh, teach men how to achieve enlightenment during their own religion, is that, uh, or is that impossible to interpret without a preset interpretation? Well, I think that's I think that's a that's very dangerous. I think that's very dangerous, and I and I think it's wrong. The, but here, look at the look at the at the very end of the council when the Pope Pope Paul VI spoke. He covered all bases, and he said, "Just remember, there's nothing dogmatic about this council. You're not held to any dogma." All right, but. Yeah, just let just let me take care of let me take care of like, cover all my bases, cover all your bets, right? Well, my point was at that if there's nothing dogmatic about the council, but I mean, what, what I don't know why are we studying it? I mean, I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn the faith. I want to know my faith, and you're telling me, well, we've got a whole bunch of documents that have nothing. You know, they're valid today. They're kind of interesting today. They might not be tomorrow. Well. All right. Uh, anyway, let's, let me let me not go there completely. Let me let me reel myself back. Okay, just a little bit. You asked me about Paul the Sixth, Pope Paul the Sixth, when when Pope when Papa Roncalli or John the Twenty Third died. I believe it was in nineteen sixty three. We'll we'll ask Matteo to look that up. I believe it's nineteen sixty three. When he died in 1963, the next pope was Paul VI, was Montini. Now, let me go back to my first story. Montini was the one who paid for all of the education of my mentor, Marini. Right? You've got Montini from the mountains and Marini from the sea. Right? Monte, mountain, mar, sea. Right? So when Montini became pope, of course, Marini, Mario Marini, had, had an automatic in. He was in like Flynn. Paul VI finished the Second Vatican Council, and there we went. I'm going to propose something to you that's my own opinion. It was also Monsignor Marini's opinion. It was also Cardinal Gagnon's opinion. It was, also, it was also Cardinal Benelli's opinion. Uh, the, if you wanted to pinpoint, here we are, Pope John the 23rd died, 3rd of, Ju 3rd of June, I lost the, I lost the, the, the uh, It was 1963, you were right. 1963, well, that was good. I'm glad I'm right once. Anyway, uh, here's the deal. When Pope Paul VI took over in 1963 as Pope, he was elected as Pope. Let me go back to the election of John the 23rd, right? Pope Pius XII died. Now we need a new Pope. Before Pope Pius XII died, a few years before his death, he had Montini in the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is the Department of State. It's the most important Department of the Vatican. They oversee everything. You have different departments, like you have in the government, but the Secretary of State is is really calling the calling the shots, right? 
So the Secretary of State is, is overseeing everything. Montini, who later became Paul VI, was in the Secretary of State as the, the Subsecretary of State. Pope Pius XII, and I, the, the Mother Pasqualina told me this many, many times, had one tremendous dislike, let's not say hatred, let's say dislike, and that was for communism. I, he didn't hate communists as people. He hated communism. He hated Marxism because philosophically it's anti-Catholic, it's anti-Christian, and it has to be. Communism, Marxism cannot exist admitting the existence of God. Can't do that. It, it's real simple. It's not complicated at all. The state has to be number one. It cannot have anything above it, anything or anyone above it for it to function. This is Marxism, and this is the reason that it's not, it's not admissible. Pius XII ordered, ordered everyone in the Secretary of State to have nothing to do with sitting down with communists in their meetings. Many times the communists were inviting Catholic clergy to their meetings to have discussions. Let's sit down and talk. Can't we just sit down and talk? Let's just sit down and talk. And, and, and you know, let's speak honestly, openly. Let's see, let's see what we've got in common, shall we? Let's do that. You don't have anything against that, do you? Well, Pope Pius XII knew the tricks of Marxism, and they would do anything to get a foot in the door, anything to get a foot in the door. And from there on, you're at their mercy. So he forbid everyone to have anything to do with them in dialogue. Well, it was discovered, he discovered, was brought to his attention, that Giovanni Battista Montini was, in fact, having discussions with communists. Why? I'll even give him this benefit of the doubt. Why? Probably because he thought he could achieve something. Let's not, let's not judge him as, as, as he, was, he was trying to betray the church. No, 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 no. I don't think so. I think I, we have a lot of people in the church who are very naive. You understand that, don't you? You do know that. All right. Yeah. Uh, Father yeah, Mark, I was going uh, yeah. to say, um, I just want to share something quick about Paul VI. Sure. He was uh, extremely naive. And um, part of that was because, uh, well, one part of it is because he was more spoiled than uh, like any other Pope I think we've had in the past like uh, century or so. And his, so for example, um, his parents, he didn't, he originally didn't really want to go to seminary, but his parents uh, made sure that he wanted to, uh, that the, he would go there. And then he was never appointed parochial vicar. He went straight from, pa he went straight from ordination to pastor. And from there, then he went to, um, he then from there, he was appointed to a uh, Pius XII secretariat. So his, his, uh, his parents spoiling him might've set up like a kind of, I want other people to do my job for me. And like an association with uh, people that uh, Father Murray's gonna talk about. Yeah, that's, that's good. I agree with everything you said. That's true. He also wanted to become a Benedictine monk. He didn't want to go into the, into the diocesan priesthood or anything like that. He wanted to be a monk. I, I'll, I'll, I won't touch that. <laughs> a lot of people say, too bad he didn't. But anyway, that, that's, that's, that's what he wanted to do, right? The, 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 the long and the short was he had a brother who was a senator, Montini. There were the two Montini brothers. His brother was a senator in Milan, involved in Christian Democrat politics. And the Christian Democrats, and I believe his brother too, they were looking for a way to dialogue, truly sit down and reason with the, with the, with the, with the communists, because the communists were becoming a large a large power in Italy. Why? Because after fascism, the fascists were anti-Catholic, they were anti-this, they were anti-that, but they were also anti-communists. 
They were anti-communists. So the communists had their own martyrs, if you will, from World War II, right? Secular martyrs of, of the communists, right? I, I hope I'm not complicating this too much for you, muddling the waters too much, but all right. So at the end of the war, you had a lot, especially in the north of Italy, northern Italy, a lot of communists. And what they were trying to do is figure out a way to live together with the Christian Democrats, who were a majority, but in some places, just a slight majority. The brother of Montini had some meetings with these people, especially labor people. All right? I don't know if this will surprise you. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of Saul Alinsky? Absolutely. You have, huh? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely ah. man. Lovely man. <laughs> That's one description. I, and well, it's, we, we are, this is public, right? <laughs> I've got yeah. to watch. <laughs> I've got to watch. Yes, it is, it is so, public. <laughs> so, but, but uh, Alinsky, Montini, if you can imagine, they were, they were, in, they were writing back and forth. Right? With this idea of the, of the workers. How do we help the workers? Now, see, all of these are, are noble ideas. How do we help the workers? I mean, who, who wants to say, how do we not help the workers? How do we destroy the work? Come on. Everybody wants to help everybody. So it's a noble sounding thing. But the problem with communism and the problem with Marxism is it sucks you in. <laughs> you're, you're pulled into their, they're the ones who are, who are ruling. You, I, you know, you should listen to you should listen to uh, uh, Professor Peterson on 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 the moral objections that he gives to communism. And I think if if you can still object, if you still find something uh, noble in communism after listening to, to that. He gives the statistics of how many millions were killed by communism, right? Just and he says now total that up, and if anybody can defend that that this is a wonderful thing, there's something wrong here, right? Anyway, you've got this sort of mishmash going on. Well, Pope Pius XII, when he found out that Monsignor Montini was dialoguing, having meetings in secret against the Pope's wishes with the communists, he said goodbye. He sent him out of the Secretary of State. Something that you have to remember, remember I, I was defining that word Romanita, Romanita, Right? The yeah. Romanness, the way we do things in Rome. Well, one of the things that they did, the church did in its hierarchy is the following. Anyone who had a higher uh, uh, rank, ecclesiastical rank, was never fired. You don't fire these people. You promote them to something else. You promote them to get rid of them. Right? So... All of a sudden, Montini was promoted to Archbishop of Milan, but never made a cardinal. Therefore, he could not vote in the next election. When the Pope Pius XII died, John XXIII, who was 78 years old at the time, was elected Pope. Why was he elected? He was elected. Father Mert, I, yes. can, but before you get into John the 23rd, which is super important, um, can you just please debunk the uh, Siri theory that Cardinal Siri was actually elected Pope and John the 23rd is a fake Pope uh, for all of us? No, 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 that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. And uh, would, would, that, would that it were. I mean, that would be wonderful if Siri had been elected Pope. <laughs> believe me, believe me, it would, it would have been wonderful. Uh, Cardinal Siri, I only met him. I only met him twice. Uh, um, a, a, just a great man. Cardinal Siri was who Pope who Pope Pius the Twelfth wanted to succeed him. All right, and I'll tell you why he didn't promote that. But let me finish this with John the Twenty Third. Imagine this. This is going to sound harsh. What I'm going to say: John the Twenty Third was elected to die. That's why he was elected. And before he was to die, <laughs> he was to make Cardinal Montini. And then he could die. 
and then they would have an election and Montini would be elected. You see how that works? That is Romanita. <laughs> that makes Romani that's Romanita. That's how things were done. So John the 23rd was elected. And the, the problem with the problem with papal elections is there can be there, they're not to be, they're not to be, so that is valid. There are not to be any conditions for which a man accepts the papacy. John the 23rd accepted two conditions. He would make Montini a cardinal, and he would make Tardini his secretary of state, because he, which was not a bad thing. He needed somebody sensible to be behind him, and Tardini was a good man, right? He died, Pope Paul VI is elected. Things are going along, and here's the pinpoint that I started talking about before, where, where, where things went south, all right? Things went south when Pope Paul VI wrote Humane Vitae on human life, the, the, the encyclical on human life, in which the church officially condemns artificial birth control. And it's a very, if you have not read Humane Vitae, you should. It's not long, it doesn't take you a long time. It's very good, beautifully written, and what it's saying is, what it's, what it's really saying, we talk about the spirit of every document. Here's the spirit of Humane Vitae. The spirit of Humane Vitae is saying, be careful. This is the first door that opens. The next one is abortion. The next one is euthanasia. The, the next one is, is experimentation, genetic, be careful. Be careful with monkeying around with human life. That's what Umane Vitae is saying in a, in a very beautiful way. Read it, please. I, I, I wish you all would read it. Before that came out, days before it was even published, a group of radical priests in the United States of America, you can find their names listed. They're, it's not hard to, to find, protested in front of the apostolic delegate with the nuncio's uh, mission in Washington, DC. Six of them were suspended by the Archbishop Cardinal of Washington, DC for protesting with signs. They're walking out in front of, uh, they're against Humane Vitae, against the encyclical, all right? Well, when that happened, it was in all of the newspapers. This was a big thing. Instead of holding the line, Pope Paul VI contacted the Archbishop of, of Washington, D.C., and told him to lift the suspension of those priests. And to apologize to them. That was it. It's over. <laughs> that was it. That was the, that was the end of a disciplined Catholic Church in the United States. That was the beginning of the end. From there on, things were shaky. Finally, in 1972, Pope Paul VI himself, naive, and again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he's a bad man, I'm not saying that, but if you're, to, if you're called to be Pope, if you're called to be President of the United States, if you're called to be the, the head of anything that's serious, you've got you've to be wise to what's happening. You have to know what's, what's happening around you. Not naive, not naive. All of a sudden, Paul VI announces, the smoke of Satan has entered through a crack in the sanctuary walls. The smoke of Satan has entered into the church. Well, yes, yes, yeah, oh, there's no doubt about that. He started hearing all sorts of conflicting things about what was happening all over the world. Chaos was happening all over the world. Liturgically, it was a zoo. Thank God you didn't live through it. 
It was, it was just upside down, inside out. Nothing made sense. You'd go to mass one week, it would be different the next week. Uh, it was chaos. Then in 1975, the Pope called for an investigation of the Roman Curia. Now, what is the Roman Curia? Again, again, the vocabulary. The Roman Curia are all of the offices of the Vatican. You have the Secretary of State, number one, the Congregation for Bishops, the Congregation for the Sacraments, Divine Cult, uh, Culto Divino, Divine Cult, Worship, they call it today, the Congregation for the Canonization of Saints, ca uh, Catholic Education is another congregation, etc., etc. all of the offices that have to do with the Church Universal. It was brought to the Pope's attention that he had several Freemasons. Father Merck, I, yes. I just wanted to um, ask you, some uh, commentators have, they've proposed that maybe this like waking up point for Paul VI was after the, uh, after the Dominican priest brought Cardinal Mustafa evidence of uh, Archbishop Bonini, the maker of the Nevis Ordo, for all of you who don't know who that was. Uh, they brought evidence of um, him being a Freemason of Paul VI. So would you agree that that was a wake up point or do you think it's like- How, 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 do, how do you people know so much? <laughs> Yes, it's, that's exactly. It's that's literally, it. that's literally, literally, that's exactly true. Well, <laughs> that's basically exactly true. Just well, Will knows everything. Yeah. Well, it's 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 it actually is true. It actually is true. Dang. Uh, Staffa, Staffa, <laughs> and and uh, and one other. Actually, there were four, uh, top officials, two cardinals that I that I know. Staffa was one of them. I won't tell you the other one. Went to the Pope with, with with documentation they didn't go with rumors they went with documentation and they showed it to him i mean it's something that you couldn't refute it was obvious and this was about bunini he also had another problem the pope also had another problem And we had the same problem. And, and look, look how shrewd. I want to. I want to point this out. Let me not go through this. How shrewd this is. When these accusations against two men for being members of Freemasons, there were only two that I knew of. Might be three or four, but I knew of two. That's all that most people knew of. When that happened, you know what happened immediately afterwards? There was there was a whole list of of of, of tons of people who were accused of being Freemasons to minimize the effect <laughs> of the reality. You know, are you following what I'm saying? There were two that were that were there were two that was listed and two that there was proof about. And all of a sudden, the list came out, including those two, but adding like 150 others, <laughs> right? Which, which dilutes, <laughs> it, it, it's like adding water to soup. It dilutes the, the original charges. And th this one is saying, well, I'm not a Freemason and I'm on the list. And well, he's not a Freemason and he's on the list. Well, all of a sudden, everybody's denying it. Well, the two who actually were, they denied it too. <laughs> and why not? This is all the crazy reactionaries. Well, it wasn't reactionary in the case of two. And one of them was Bunini. And another one after Bunini was a man by the name of Baggio. 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 Sebastian Cardinal Baggio. Why are these people important? Well, Bunini, as I think you know, created his own mass. This is an outrage. <laughs> it's still an outrage. I still get angry. I was just talking to somebody the other, the other day, two days ago, said, well, they, all they did was change the mass from Latin into English. And I said, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Would and then they talk were? about uh, Would that they, it were. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a bad spirit of the new mass. It's just the yeah, spirit of the new mass. <laughs> Nothing there bad about it in rubric. All right. So you're way ahead of me. You already, you already know this. That, <laughs> that, but, but the problem with Cardinal Baggio 
also was that Cardinal Baggio is naming all of the bishops of the world. Every time a bishop resigns, remember they moved down after the Second Vatican Council, the Pope took away the privilege of bishops remaining until they died. Just, just like the Pope remains in office until he dies, well, every bishop in the world remained in office until he died. He was a patriarch. He was, he was the bishop. He was your father. He didn't stop being your father when he turned 75. They remained. Well, Paul VI put out a new document saying, no, at 75, everybody has to uh, uh, resign or write a letter of resignation, and then we'll, we'll decide if you continue or not. Well, that limited the whole thing, so a whole new slew of bishops were to be made. Well, when you've got a Freemason naming the bishops, what kind of bishops do you think you're going to get as, in a lot of cases? I'm being, very, I'm being very prudent, aren't I, in a lot of cases, rather than saying all. <laughs> but they, they were all liberals, all liberals. If you look at Time magazine from, 19, I think it's 1970-something, when another, um, another man by the name of Jadot, who was the papal nuncio to the United States, when he finally went into retirement, he said the greatest accomplishment of his ecclesiastical career was having named more than 75 liberal bishops in the United States of America. He, that's what he said himself, to shake things up. Well, they shook things up. They certainly did. Cardinal Bernadine for sure. Oh, good Lord. Yes, Cardinal Bernadine for sure, one of them. So in 1975, the Pope named, this, this is a complicated thing, and I'm going to try to make it simple, uh, rather than get, get, getting lost in the weeds here. He named uh, Archbishop Edward Gagnon, French-Canadian, also, let me underscore, a saint. A saint with the greatest sense of humor and a fun man, just a, 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 a great man, a great man. I, he was one of, it's one, of the, the, one of the many people in my life that I've loved, just, just authentically good. Well, they found the right guy to do it. The Pope charged him with doing an investigation of the entire Roman Curia. Well, this is, a, this is a, an, an incredible assignment, the entire Roman Curia. It took him three years to do this, and he worked relentlessly, day and night, day and night, day and night, interviewing, uh, re redacting documents. Finally, he finished, and at the, at the same time that he's doing this, he's living next door to me or I'm living next door to him. Whichever way, is, whichever way sounds more humble on, on my part, humbler on my part. I live next door to him, I should say. It's, a, it's like the man who wrote the book, all of the people who met me in my life, you know, <laughs> not, not, who, not who I met, who met me. Anyway, Gagnon did a fantastic study and he came to many conclusions. When he was done, it was, I think it was in June, it was June of 1978, June of 1978. He brought that study to the Pope in private audience and put it in three volumes on the Pope's desk. He also brought in a smaller piece of paper, a few pieces and pieces of paper in, in, a, uh, in a folder with the major changes that needed to be made ASAP for, to, to detain this smoke from further entry into the sanctuary of Satan. One of them was, they had already gotten rid of Bugnini. They sent him, again, you don't fire these people. I don't know why you don't fire these people. They should be fired. But he wasn't fired. He was sent as nuncio to Iran. Is it to Iran or to Iraq? I can never get the two. I'm sorry. It was Iran. Iran. There were approximately, I don't know, something like 3,000 or 4,000 Catholics in the entire country. They sent him where he could do the least damage. 
and he was forgotten and he died there. His work, however, wasn't forgotten. It, it remained. Cardinal Gagnon also said the thing to do was to change immediately the prefect for the Congregation of Bishops, the man who's making bishops all over the world, Sebastian Cardinal Baggio. Paul VI, again, typical of his, this is the way his personality was, his character. He said to Bishop Gagnon, let's put these off to the side. I'm old. I'm tired. Leave this for my successor. Well, I drove him to that audience and I picked him up from that audience and brought him home. He was not happy, Gagnon, not happy at all because he wanted something done now. The Pope died two months later on August 6th. The rest of it I'm not gonna tell you because the rest of it is gonna be in my book. My book starts with August 6th. It's gonna start with the election of John Paul I, all right? That's how it's going to begin. And it's going to have a lot to do with that dossier and the role that that dossier played in the election of John Paul the I and in John Paul the Second, And it's gonna deal with the death of John Paul the I. Anyway, I'll leave Governor, it at that. Is, uh, I, I've read your, uh, your book, Godmother. It's a magnificent. If um, he gives a basic overview of all everything what he's talking about, just quoting his conversations from Mother Pascalina, he mentioned earlier, it's a magnificent book. It's not just about uh, the infiltration. It's also about, they like talk about prayer. They talk about many things. It's a great read. Um, you should all buy it. But when is your uh, book going to be coming out, Father Mer? How about as soon as I finish it? <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe six months. I, I started it, right. and that's that's the major thing to start. Yeah. But, but look, let me just. I, I don't. How much more time do we have here? Uh, we can stay as long as you're available. Well, yeah. I'm available. For, you know, that's very dangerous to say to me because you could be here at midnight. But <laughs> until you're just, bored, let, let me, until I fall asleep. Until you fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> until you're bored, until he falls asleep. Sounds you're like you're the human thermometer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be here a couple hours, I guess. Huh? No, no. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna end now. I'm because I'm gonna be merciful to our to yeah. all of you. <laughs> yeah. But I'm gonna. But I want to encourage you this. Young men, I think I think what you're doing, what you're starting, what you're what you're accomplishing, uh, is is uh, somebody has a question. Yeah, I'll take a question. Yeah, sure, I'll take a question. But let me just let me just finish this thought. What you're doing is nothing less than magnificent. It's great. It's what you're supposed to be doing. It's what we need. You, if you love the church, and I do, I love the church. If you love her. Give to her, give to her, help her, help her survive. These are, these are not easy times. They're bad times. They're horrible times. Uh, and we need, first and foremost, education. We have the most ignorant Catholic laity I have ever seen in my life. It's amazing. It's just amazing. It's not surprising because I think for, for over 40 years, you've, you've received sermons uh, the most exciting thing about the sermons is that the, the sky is blue and the grass is green and just go on and on and on about nonsense. I've, I've, I've sat through some of the sermons in, in, the, in, the, in the new church. I don't know what they're talking about. Nobody talks about heaven. Nobody talks about hell. Nobody talks about purgatory. Everybody who dies has gone to heaven and is playing golf. Uh, uh, <laughs> even, even though in the, first, in the first row, you've got the three paramours sitting there and, 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 and this, that, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It is a mess. And if we're going to get it back together, it depends on you. It depends on you, young people. Not on us. We're, I, I'm on my way out. And, I, and frankly, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm so excited about heaven. I really am excited about heaven. I can't wait. I don't know what in the world people are afraid of. I don't understand that. But anyway, I'm not. I'm excited and looking forward to it. But I leave you this mess. And you have to inherit this mess. It's terrible. I wish it were otherwise, but it's it's uh, it's unfortunate. But the greatest the greatest weapon you're going to have in any of this is education. 
it's educating yourselves and, and learning your faith and learning the history of the church. Church history is the most fascinating thing in the world. I'm telling you, it is. It's not boring at all. It's unbelievable. The characters you meet, you couldn't, you couldn't meet them in any Russian play. They're, this is incredible. I mean, just the, the 2000 year history is fantastic. Anyway, I'm open to any questions you've got. Oh, let, let, me, let me just say one other word. Education, yes, yes, yes. And don't forget prayer. If, if I may, I would suggest to all of you, especially you young men, you're gonna be future fathers. Hopefully some of you are gonna be future priests. <laughs> look at the Latin mass, look at the Latin mass. If you can get a chance to attend the Latin Mass, do it. I have for the last for the last years of uh, of these last years here, I say the Tridentine Mass every day. I've, I've rediscovered it. This is after years of saying the the, the Novus Ordo. I'm not saying the Novus, Novus Ordo Mass is invalid. I'm not saying that. Not saying it is either. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> This is public. I'm not, saying, I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm not getting there. I'm not going there. I, I'm simply saying, believe me, believe me. I'm telling you, this is the honest truth as a priest. To say the Tridentine Mass to me was like saying a, my first Mass. It was absolutely fantastic. It's it's the mystery is back. The 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 I I'm speaking to God during the whole mass, it's fantastic. It's moving, it's beautiful, it is a religious experience. I would encourage you to, to, to know, to love and cherish, and to assist at that mass as much as you possibly can. And you know, uh, you know I, I think you know that I'm, I'm revolutionary enough to, to believe what I'm going to tell you in just a minute. And here's what I'm gonna tell you. You know how this irritates the left. You know how it irritates the left. It just, it really does. It drives them crazy. And it drives them crazy because you're not going where they want you, which is God knows where. I don't know where they want you. And I don't understand what the end of, result of it is. I know where I'd like you. And that's to be connected, to be connected with God, to be connected to the church and to be living in the state of grace. That's where I'd like you. And this is a great help. The Tridentine Mass, prayer life, you've got your rosary, don't give it up, continue it, continue it. You know what I used to do when I was in Mexico? I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't say the rosary and drive at the same time. Did you, do did, did the steering wheels of the new cars have little grooves for your fingers when you're driving? Do they have them? They don't have them anymore? Is it just all smooth, the steering wheel? Uh, I think it depends on I think the new the steering seat wheels seat are all smooth. We used to have grooves where your fingers would go to hold like in the 10 in the 10 and two position of the steering wheel and underneath your fingers would be in grooves. Well, I would scratch one of those grooves here and then down below 10 spaces down, put another scratch. And I'd say the rosary just driving just with that. That was my rosary, but it, say the rosary, keep the rosary there and, and the Latin mass, bring it back, mm -hmm. make it strong. Be great fathers of families. Remember, remember, remember this. I've said this in other interviews. I'm in fourth grade. The nun who was there, a great lady, we became good friends uh, as adults, taught us beautifully. She said that when, to all the fourth graders, how many boys here want to be priests? Everybody's hand went up in those days. Everybody's hand, except one, one strange one fellow wanted to be a, a fireman. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but everybody wanted to be a priest. And she said, she said, now remember, to be a good priest, and I want you to listen carefully, young men, listen to this. To be a good priest, you have to be a person, a man, who would be a good father and a good husband. I raised my hand, I said, but I, I thought priests couldn't get married and couldn't have children, couldn't have a family. And she said, that's not what I'm saying at all. I didn't understand that until years later, when all of a sudden I started seeing priests who didn't inspire me as, pro as fathers, possible fathers, or good husbands. But those 
who could make good husbands and good fathers make good priests. So remember that when you're, when you're discerning your vocation, we need strong men in the priesthood. We need men who aren't afraid and men who are going to pronounce the truth and stand up for it nobly. Now, I'm open to any questions you've got. I, I, first of all, I've got to tell you, before I start the questions, I'm amazed at how much you're tolerating. <laughs> I, I, would, I myself would have been asleep uh, 45 minutes ago. I could, I could listen to you for hours, Father Murray. But isn't that remarkable? Because I can talk that long. Yeah, I wish <laughs> you didn't. Coinc- what a coincidence. <laughs> uh, and awesome. also, uh, just quickly, uh, I just wanted to bring up something. Um, before, Josh, you can ask your question right after I say this. But uh, I'm really glad you're writing a book about, at least from John Paul I uh, to, to John Paul II, because um, I keep telling, uh, like, I, we have conversations in, like, the group even about this. And they go, oh, where's a good source that I can find on, uh, like, the infiltration? So I go, oh, uh, have Father Charles Murr. And they're like, oh, he doesn't have much. Of, he like he says doesn't have a YouTube channel. He doesn't have talks I can listen to. He has one book where he kind of briefly outlines. The, well, I, first of all, I don't say go to Dr. Taylor Marshall and infiltration. Dr. I don't Taylor say that. Marshall? I say, uh, <laughs> so I say to go to you. And they're always like, oh, he doesn't have any New books. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well. I think, I think the, 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 anyway, the, I, hopefully the book that I'm writing is going to be impactful. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be, a, I think it's going to have an impact. And it has very much to do, it has very much to do with how close we, we, we came at those, at, at that time, to having a Freemason as Pope. Mm. We came very close to it. And the, and the people who, who made things happen otherwise. And the consequences, it cost one man his life. Anyway, it, it's, it's, I think you're going to like it. And, I, and I'm telling you right now, I dare anyone to tell me it's not true. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I've heard your, uh, like people get into conspiracies about this and they're like, oh yeah, all this stuff happened with John Paul I. And I've heard your, uh, like a portion of your story about it, And you're like, oh, you think that's good? You think your theory is good? when this is what actually happened. And I've only heard a person, portion of it. So I'm super excited. Now, Josh, can you ask your question? Yeah, he actually kind of answered my question. Right, right. As I said, I wait, I have a question. Then they kept talking. I was like, wait, Father, no, no, you answer my question now. So you're good. Awesome. I think what I was going to ask was, uh, with this whole situation in the church, what, what would you say for my generation to do? But then you kind of answered that with the prayer and all that. So. Uh. Other than like uh, the, the imitation of Christ, uh, what do you think are the best uh, spiritual books for people like us to be reading? Wow, I would suggest I would suggest as a prepar- as a preparation. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. If you're a follower of Christ, sooner or later you're going to have a tremendous conflict with one of your apostles, with one of your disciples, with one of your friends. You're going to have an encounter with Judas. Each one of you, each one of you, and remember I'm telling you, this old man is telling you right now, and you're young people, and you may think, ah, what is he now? What is he talking about? Each one of you is going to be betrayed, seriously betrayed, at least once in your life at least once in your life. I, I would recommend now that you read St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul. Uh, I, I, just, I just got shivers by saying it. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And it will prepare you, if anything prepares you for that, it will prepare you for that. The, the dark night of the soul is also this. Just because you're Catholics now, and just because you're filled with, seriously filled with grace of the Holy Ghost, and you're excited about your faith, and you want to learn more, and you want to be authentic Christian men, Catholic men, that doesn't mean that in the future you're not going to be betrayed and you're not going to experience a 
time, and it might be a very long time, of spiritual dryness. It's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that it's part of the whole deal. It's not, a, it's not a chastisement. It's not a punishment. It's part of the whole plan. You have to go through it to get to the other side. Look, you know, I had, I had a brother, God rest him, who got into drugs when he was uh, 14, 13, 14. Incredibly young at that time. He was outrageously young at that time. Uh, and I'll just put it this way. He died at age uh, 53 of a heart attack. Handsome, handsome uh, man. Could be the funniest person. You would have him at a party. Lost his personality, lost everything else. But, but he died. He was spiritually, emotionally, mentally 14 years old. And the reason he was 14 years old is by using drugs, he avoided every hurdle in life. Every problem that came up, the problems that we're given, what I'm trying to say is the problems you're going to be facing in life, the problems that each one of us is given are to be dealt with and then get on to the next one and deal with it. That's called maturity. When you run around on the outside of all of those hurdles and don't take them, you never mature. You just, you don't get there. You have to go through that. You remember when you were a boy and you'd be in bed at night and you'd, you'd start crying because your knee hurt or your elbow hurt or your, your, uh, your shoulder hurt, there was a pain. And your mother came to you and said, there's nothing to worry about. Those are called growing pains. You just have them. Remember those? Remember those? Or am I the only one that had them? No, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm so happy to see other heads nodding. Yes. <laughs> but those growing pains are necessary. You have to go through them. And drugs and everything else let you not go through them. Right? When, when I'm talking about spiritual dryness, and the absence, feeling the absence of God in your life after you've known him, I'm telling you, you have to go through that. That's what you have to go through to get to the other side. All right? Mm. That's going to come. And if you're not prepared for that, young man, goodbye. You're not going to make it. Mm. And I want to see you on the other side. I want to see you on the other side. I want you to get through that. Read St. John of the Cross. You want something to start with? Read St. John of the Cross. Great man. Imprisoned by his own church. Okay? Imprisoned by the church, by the, by the Inquisition. Rather than leave the church and scream, he helped reform it. Great man. Anyway, uh, you have, what else? You have, you have, <laughs> what yeah, else? <laughs> more awesome. question. Uh, we have a uh, question. Two mini questions from Jaden. So, Jaden, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you, Will. Um, to be honest, Father, I wasn't even sure of joining the Zoom chat at first. <laughs> and, uh, but thankfully... Well, I, hope you, I, hope you, I hope you didn't repent. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but then Will managed to convince me because, um, yeah, I was going to, like, pray and do other stuff, honestly. But uh, he was like, it's, a, it's worth it. And, uh, yeah, he was right about that. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. I'm glad if you, I'm glad you got something out of it. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, so I have two mini questions. And the first sure. one is, um, you lived during that crazy time, you know, the '60s, and uh, like, and you experienced the interim rights. And we have this group chat, and we kind of make jokes about it, how it's better than Norvis Ordo or not better, and stuff like that. How was it like in those interim rights kind of like era? I I I, I would start to answer that this way. It depended where you were. It depended what you had. It was a, a battle was happening. It depended what def, it depended on what defenses you had to go into that battle, right? Those who didn't know too much, and they're kind of the majority of the world in anything, 
uh, those who didn't know too much had no problem with Kumbaya. The, the guitars came out and uh, the this came out and the that came out. And, and after the Kumbaya, they just walked out the door and never saw the church again. It didn't matter. When, when they realized that the church was trying, here's, here, I guess this is what I'm trying to say. When, the, when they saw that the church was trying to get to their level, they had bamboozled the church, just as they had bamboozled their parents. If a teenager can get his parents to, see, to feel sorry for him and start listening to the nonsense that he's spewing out and he sees that they believe it, He's made it. He's fooled them. Well, they saw they saw these adults learning how three chords on a guitar and growing their hair long and and, <laughs> and strumming these pathetic folks. It, it was pathetic. Most of it was pathetic. Most of it was sad. It's just sad. It's, did, did you ever see what is that program on? Uh, America, America's Got Talent or something. Yes, right? yes. Right? Yeah. And you see somebody poor. I mean, these are poor souls. They just have no talent at all. How they got on the program is just, you know, it's a, they got on the program because somebody had a really warped sense of humor, right? Mm -hmm. To make fun of these people. And you're seeing them and you just feel sorry for them. That's the way I felt going to these masses. I'm looking at these priests who are trying to be... <laughs> They're trying to be hip and they're trying to be this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> and and, and, and it, it was it was it was ridiculous, it was sad, it was pathetic. And most of the people who were educated with me let, have already left the church. They left the church years ago, years ago. We had our I can't believe I'm hearing myself say this. Last year we had our 50th anniversary from graduation in high school. 50! I can't believe I'm saying it. Right? 50 years. I don't think, I don't think there were, there were, this is a Catholic high school run by the Christian brothers, by the way. I didn't go to public high school. Let me, let me, let me change that. Oh, sorry about I, that. I wish I had. I wish I had. I would have been less confused about my faith. We got the, we got, <laughs> we were in the whole thing. Well, one day we'd come to class for religion and instead of seven sacraments, there were now eight. The church is a sacrament. So there are eight sacraments. Uh, don't worry about the Ten Commandments because they're really not ten; they're two. Don't we everything was absolute chaos, and you're taught. And people who are teaching this, you knew that they didn't know what they were saying. We had a, we had a teacher. Let me just a parenthesis here. I'm full of parentheses. We had a teacher who knew nothing about history, and he was teaching history, and it was it was. It was painful. It was painful to see him try to teach. He was one page ahead of us. He read. He read. He read tomorrow's lesson you know, last night. That, that's it. That's it. I, I just. Just a minute. Well, they did the same thing with religion. These are people who don't know what they're. They didn't know what they were talking about to begin with, and now they're changing and trying to. To, to, to update things, it, it was just, it was horrible. They left everybody in a total state of confusion. And then, then, you want the cream on top of the, of the dessert? Well, if it feels good, do it. There, there, you want, you want new morality? This started in the mid-60s. I had never heard such a bizarre answer in my life. If, well, if it feels good, do it. It must be good. Don't worry about it. This is what we were hit with. After years of understanding, I told you at the beginning, I went to Rome to study Aristotelian logic. <laughs> That's what I wanted to study. I love logic. I love it. I love a great debate. I, I love sitting down and talking to somebody. I get very frustrated when I know I'm talking to a buffoon. But I, I shouldn't say I get... I, no, I just, we did, then we talk about the weather or something. We just talk about some, I'm not, I'm not trying to be unpleasant or unkind, but it's a waste of time. And you know that. So you just, you try to be, I, I love that word nice. Do you know where the word nice comes from, by the way? Mm, yeah, no. Do you know where the word, it, be nice, the church of nice, just, just go along, get along. The word nice comes from, it, it, it comes from Latin. 
ignorante, from ignorant. <laughs> somebody who does, yes, it does. Somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about is, well, he's nice. He just, you know, he's just nice, get by. Anyway, um, I don't know where I'm going with all of this. Those years, <laughs> those years, those years were horrible. They were horrible. Yeah, uh, Jaden, just before um, you asked your second question, I was just going to say in The Godmother, Father Murr shared uh, one of the greatest sacrilegious stories I think I've ever heard for 60s Catholicism. Um, I've told Isaac it uh, before, yeah. but um, if you want to hear it, uh, oh, then... Oh, No, look, I debated, I really debated whether to put that in or not. Yeah. Because it, but because it was so horrible. And, and, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to scandalize people, but at the same time, I said, people should wake up, you know, mm -hmm. as a priest that happened that I wasn't a priest then I was a layman in college as a priest. I'm not going to tell you where, when, or anything else to divulge the, the identity of the whole thing. I was at a parish, a posh parish. Where they gave they give out communion under both species. They have men and women, everybody running around. I don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Um, I would say you can't get into somebody's soul and judge the interior of anybody. But if you can, but you must judge exterior actions. Okay, that doesn't mean you can't you can't judge exterior. If a, if somebody comes near you with a knife. Please judge his exterior actions and move. Right? Mm -hmm. Don't 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 stand there and say I'm not going to move because I can't get to the interior of this man. I don't know what his conscience is about. Please, that's not what I'm talking about. From exterior manifestations, I don't know how many of these people even believe in the in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, and I don't know how they could treating the treating the holy the holy uh, the holy species the way they did. After Mass, we have a bishop presiding at Mass. They, they, they preside. <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody offers Mass. They preside. Right? Or celebrate. Celebrate. Or celebrate. Word. Well, th listen, the, old, the, the Latin sense of the word celebrate makes sense. The problem is that, you, that we put it into the 60s thing, and you think you have to have balloons and noisemakers <laughs> with, with yeah. celebrate. That, you know? Anyway, I walked into the sacristy. And there is the sacristan. Now, who is the sacristan? Believe me, gentlemen, I have nothing against Mohammedans. I have nothing against them at all. <laughs> I really don't. I, 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 I think they're wonderful people. It's just wonderful. It's wonderful. It's all wonderful. <laughs> However, the sacristan in this church is a Mohammedan. The sacristan. <laughs> who, is, who is taking the remainder of the precious blood, putting dove soap in it, and washing them out with dove soap oh. in the sink. I, I, I freaked out. I'm, I'm 10 or 15 years a priest at the time. When the other priest came in after concelebrating, I helped out with communion. The other came in. I said to the bishop, are you aware? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know what goes on here before you? Well, yeah, that's uh, Mohammed, and he's, uh, he's, our, he's our sacristan. He's a wonderful man, and his wife is a, his wife, I don't know if he had one or two or three or four. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she or they are wonderful person or persons, and it's all wonderful. I said, do, do, you, do you see how he's purifying I, I, I couldn't believe it. And he looked right at me and he said, do you have trouble with that? Oh. Heck yeah, I do. I said, uh, I, I said, I, do I have trouble? That was the, I was, that, that was the last time I was able to, to, to be at that parish. <laughs> yeah. Because, because you, 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 you have trouble with the way we do things here at saying such and such. <laughs> this is amazing. This is amazing. We had to live through all of this garbage. And if you're a believer, what you're seeing is the desecration of the most sacred sacrament. This is a desecration. This is horrific. And you're the only one who sees it. You're the only one bothered. There must be something wrong with you. 
<laughs> doesn't it doesn't bother Flutzy Dooley. Miriam Bushkirk seems to be fine with this. Bernard Baruch loves it. What's the matter with you? Wait, was there an actual person named Flutzy Dooley? Oh, sure. No. You don't know Jackie Gleason and Crazy Guggenheim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, I have a nickname. I'm, never mind. Jaden, go, go ahead and ask your second question. Yeah, oh. yeah. Ask you. Yeah. Flutzy, Flutzy Dooley, by the way, was neighbor to, to Fatso Fogarty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I know you kind of wanted to save for your second book, but then it was just a question, like a personal, like question. I was kind of curious, and like you, oh, and then you had a talk to you encountered, you know, with um, Pope Paul, and you were, you know, living in the Vat in the in the Vatican, you know, um, and experienced all the changes and stuff. But for me, I mean, I I got confirmed like two weeks ago, and it was under uh, Saint JP two. And then when you heard about, like, when you briefly mentioned him, I was kind of curious, like, how did you engage with him or how did you view him? I was just really curious, that's why. John Paul II? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I thought he was a great man. I thought he was personally, he was personally a holy man. Again, I think he wanted to do what was right. What I think he did wrong was jump into the to the rock star mode mm -hmm. and travel the world okay now, now is it wrong to travel the world no 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 that's not what i'm saying while he was away what is the saying that while the, while the while the cats away the mice will play well while he was away the rats played every time he made a new trip see what you're what you're unaware of he made 104 trips I, to different uh, to all over the world and the most traveled pope and, and he saw the most people that anybody's ever seen double zhushka triple whatnot you know whoa magnificent every time he made a trip that trip cost three four and sometimes five months of preparation he had to learn a new language he had to take geography lessons history lessons of every place he was going, he had to know what he was talking about. You don't just go and hear, hello everybody, what's the name of the bishop here? What's the name of the auxiliary bishop? Who runs this? Who runs that? Who's the president? Who's the vice president? Who, all of this, and you had to know that. And you had to be able to give speeches in Thai, in Korean, in in in, in Spanish, in, in the, all, all of this was preparation. So he had translators and, and, and linguists working with him hours a day for these trips. Well, what are you, what, what you're doing emphasizes what you're not doing. And the problem, his problem was, and this was the, the and I, believe me, my respect for the man, I think he's a great man. I would not call him John Paul the Great. I, 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 I don't, I, I don't, I, I, no, no. no. However, he was a great man and he was a great Pope, but he did not take care of business at home. While he was away, people were taking advantage of him being away. They loved it. There were applause every time he made a trip. And that applause in the Vatican was not a good applause as you're seeing today. You're seeing what's happening in the Vatican. You're seeing. Well, that was there, not like it is today, but it was there, it was present. It was already the beginnings of it was there. That's what he didn't take care of, and he could have. Cardinal Gagnon, or Bishop Gagnon, when John Paul I died, after he brought him those three volumes of the problems, these are serious problems in the Roman Curia. This isn't baloney. These are serious problems with serious men doing serious wrong. He wanted a reform. He brought this then to the second pope, to the third pope, I should say. He brought it to Paul VI. He brought it to John Paul I, who died trying to do what he, what Gagnon asked him to do. Okay, that'll give you, that'll give you a little hint. <laughs> that'll give you a little hint. And John Paul II, when he was elected, Gagnon went to go see him after, after with, with three weeks of his election, presented him again the three volumes of his study and the changes that needed to be done yesterday. And he said, 
well, leave them there on the desk, and when we have time, uh, we'll look at them. I was waiting for Gagnon in Cortile San Damaso in the car, in his car. He came down. I'd never seen him angry. I'd never seen Gagnon angry. He was angry. He said, take me home. No, please, no, thank you. That wasn't like him. Just take me home. We're, we're on the way home. And he said, what are you doing uh, tomorrow afternoon? I said, anything you want. What do you want to do? He said, I want you to drive me to the airport. I'm resigning. I will have nothing more to do with this. I can't. This is, a, that's enough. It's enough. I'm showing them what's, what's wrong. These are serious, serious allegations, serious charges. There's proof for everything. I've worked three years to get this done. Nobody takes it serious. And this man tells me, leave it on my desk. I'll get around to it when I can. I'm preparing right now to go to Timbuktu. He went the next day. The next day, he, he packed his bags, was ready to leave. I've got his bags. We're in the next day. He's in the car. He said, let's pass by the Vatican. He said, run my letter of resignation up to the, to the papal office the Secretary of State. I did. I did. They went berserk. How dare he? Tell him to get up here. Who does he think he is? This and the I said, he won't budge. He's leaving. What do you mean he's leaving? <laughs> he said, you go tell him I ordered him to come up. This is Cardinal Below. I said, he's not budging. He didn't want to come up. That's why he sent me with the letter. Well, he'll be sorry for this. He, I said, he said he thinks you should be sorry mm -hmm. for what you're permitting happening. And he's leaving. Well, he left. He went to Colombia, back into the jungles, preached retreats to the natives on the Sacred Heart. <laughs> and offered mass. That was it. As a bishop, he said, I, just, I can't deal with this anymore. When finally, when finally, he told, the last thing he told John Paul II, when he left, right before he left, he said, your life is in jeopardy. Your life is in jeopardy. All right. Two years later, when the Pope was shot in St. Peter's Square, the assassination attempt, he was brought to the hospital, to the Gemelli Hospital, by emergency. I, do you hear that noise going off? That's my phone. It's playing a song called El Negro Jose, because I've got a friend, a Mexican friend, his name is Jose, and he's quite dark. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this is, it's a great song, and he's a great friend. Anyway, but, but don't let that distract you. When we, we get back to, to this story, the Pope is lying in the Gemelli Hospital. Let me just tell you this, too. He's lying in Gemelli Hospital, almost dead, almost dead. And what almost killed him, gentlemen, wasn't, weren't the bullets. The doctors... And these are the finest doctors in Rome. The Gemelli is the number one clinic. It's named after Father Gemelli. It's this, it, the, the, the official name of the hospital is Sacred Heart Hospital Clinic. They gave him during the operation contaminated blood. And he, he had, had hepatitis from the contaminated blood and was about to die. It weren't, they're not the bullet wounds. It wasn't the bullets that killed him. It, it wasn't, what did they say? What was the old, the old joke that the doctors used to tell? The, the operation was successful, but the patient died. <laughs> what do you mean it was successful? Yeah, well, the operation went well. Well, they, they had given him contaminated blood. They had to fly in an American specialist by the name of Dr. Kevin Cahill from New York on a special jet of tropical diseases was his specialization. He was a great man, a, a good, good, good man. Flew him, and he saved the Pope's life from the contaminated blood, right? 
that that's how he got back. When the Pope came to, because he was unconscious for quite some time, days, they say I wasn't there, but they say that the first thing he said when he came to was, find Gagnon. Father Mur, uh, we actually, uh, I heard the story from uh, you a long time ago. So we actually have, uh, our youth group is set up in a chat. So we just uh, have everyone in it. And we have a subsection of that that is called Get Gagnon after I told the story. So we decided to name the chat that. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> find Gagnon, oh. right. Well, he found Gagnon and, and ordered him back to Rome. And Gagnon said he would come on one condition that they get rid of Sebastian Cardinal Baggio, which the Pope finally did, finally. But the damage, gentlemen, was done for almost, for almost 12 years. Most of the bishops in the world were replaced with uh, a different kind of bishop. I think you're aware of what kind of bishop we have, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm not gonna get into judging Don't have. Anyway, that's that. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. You, haven't, you haven't had enough? No. I actually have a, I have a question. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Calder, and then uh, you, and then. Uh, okay. Wait, wait. So, uh, if you, if you, you've already been here for almost an almost two hours. It's been an hour and forty eight minutes. My gosh, so, I've got mass. What time is it? No, exactly. It's eight no, o'clock. I'm okay. Yes. I'm okay. Okay. Five o'clock mass here. So as soon as you need to go, just leave. Um, <laughs> but uh, right. Calder, Calder has a question and Josh has a question. So right. Calder, uh, go ahead. Right. I have a, a couple of questions because, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, father. Um, oh, so my, my, first, um, my first question is regarding local bishops. And of course, you were speaking about that absolutely horrific uh, disgrace to our lords um, with the gentleman in the sacristy. Yes. And it sort, of, it sort of goes on to uh, my first question, which is, uh, and the, in England, we're lucky because this doesn't happen as much, but it does happen quite often. We, we have these bishops who are, we are meant to respect and we're meant to abide by everything they say in the diocese. But these bishops will refuse to let us take communion on the tongue and they will not allow the traditional Latin mass to actively take place. So much so that I have to leave my own diocese just so I can attend the extraordinary form on Sundays. So how how can we look up to these men and or these people that we're meant to call my Lord or your Excellency, these honourable gentlemen in the priesthood? How are we meant to look up to these bishops if they are not allowing us to attend the extraordinary form and not allowing us to take the host in a way which shows our devotion and our respect to Christ? That's a great, a, a very, a great and very pragmatic question. Very, it is. And I, I feel for you. I really do. Mm, I, thank you, I, I've got the privilege, I've got the privilege as a priest to, to be able to say mass every day. And I just, I don't, I really don't, I, I don't, uh, it's not a problem for me. And I, it, and it, and I should understand and, and sympathize even, even greater, but it's just, I, I, I it's not a, a problem that I face because I don't, I, because I have the privilege of saying mass. Mm. I would do the following. First of all, I'm sorry, but I would not receive communion in the hand ever. I wouldn't no. do that. I wouldn't no. do that. And I wouldn't do that because, you know, here, look at the logic in this. I told you I, I like logic. Not that I'm great in it, but I like it. Uh, when, the, when, this, when this Protestant, it, how, why was this started? It was started to diminish the belief in the real presence to get you familiar with it. And you're so familiar in, with it, it's nothing. It means nothing now. That's the idea. Well, that's how it started. And it started in, in Protestantism for that end, right? Uh, I, would re I would never receive communion except on the tongue. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't care. I, don't, I would go without communion. 
I would make a spiritual communion and invite our Lord to be with me in spiritual communion rather than, rather than doing that sacrilege because I see the effects of it. And we all see the effects of it. We've lost the, the greatest percentage of, there goes my phone again. That's the cowboy. The Marlboro man is out. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's another one. Anyway, the, uh, and, and, and attend, the, and attend the extraordinary, the extraordinary, but they call it the extraordinary, the TL, the, the traditional Latin mass, yes. uh, the extraordinary form, if you will, that's fine. Ex attend it when you can and participate fully when you can. And that's all. Look, there are, there are Christians all over the world who cannot attend, Catholics all over the world who cannot attend mass. Mm. They, they can't attend. They don't have one. It's not present. Uh, we, we've had, when I was in Mexico, so many of the Mexican men would come up to work in the United States and came back, they, would, they came back scandalized at what they would see in these parishes. And they stopped going to mass. They said, mm. we don't know what to do. They've got women giving out communion, wearing funny hats and this and the other, and the priest is dressed up as a clown. Mm. Are you kidding me? I said, they said, I said, don't go, stop going. Get the readings of the day, get the gospel of the day from the mass, get together as a group, read them. Don't t tell each other what it means. <laughs> Just read them slowly, clearly, and say the rosary. That's it, until you can attend a real that, mass. Yes, right? that, is, that is actually um, something Father Robert Bruciani, who is the uh, district superior for the Society of St. Pius X, who I, um, who's acting as my vocations director uh, for the most part. The one thing he told me to do is not partake in the Norvus Ordo Mass, but rather attend to fulfill your Sunday obligation and just pray a rosary during. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's I think that's wise counsel. I, I I think there's nothing wrong with that. I'll get in trouble. I'll get in trouble for saying that, but I'm being honest with you. I think that's good. Yeah. Wait, I zoned out. Are we talking about praying the rosary during the mass? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah all right. Just checking. And um, <laughs> see, so, so yeah, I've got I've got one more. Uh, one more and then one really quick question afterwards oh. shouldn't take more look I, 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 I'm interested in my faith Isaac give me a minute <laughs> yeah well, so, if Father Murray is willing to keep going then we can keep going as long as he yeah. wants yeah as, as long as it's okay with you Father of course I, ha I have mass in a few minutes but it's, but it's in it's oh here, goodness it's here, at, it's here at home but anyway go ahead quick alright okay so second question uh, I they, you know, I, I, I'm 99% sure that I want to be a priest and I really don't see myself doing anything else in my life other than the priesthood. I thought about it deeply. I've, you know, I've tried dating girls. I really don't enjoy being in, you know, I, I don't see myself being a married man at all. And I see myself in the priesthood with the society, but I also struggle with a lot of things and I'm in a period where I know that I want to be a priest, but I'm also seem to be losing my faith. And as someone who wants to be the spiritual father, especially in a traditional community like the SSPX, it, I, 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 I struggle to be able to continue discerning my vocation if I'm struggling with these sorts of spiritual problems. But, you know, especially with it just even sometimes just believing with a lot of the things which go on in my life and the world, it's hard to believe in Christ. And I, you know, and I, it's just, how, how can I fix that father? Because oh, I, yeah. Sure. <laughs> how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, I mean, uh, let me, let me, let me give you the short, the short answer to that. Uh, you have problems, you have temptations, you have the, well, welcome to the club. Hmm. I'm going to tell you. So, I'll tell you something else. I'll give you a big, uh, a big uh, uh, revelation here. Uh, those problems stay with you kind of all all through your life. You have mm. to learn how to deal with them. You just have to learn how to deal with them. Everybody has a cross. I thank God that mine isn't greater than a lot of other people that I know. It's it's mm. bearable. My crosses, my cross, and my crosses. Take them as a cross. Go with them. Let me just add something else to that. Try to develop a good sense of humor. <laughs> Very important, I'm serious. 
Start reading Chesterton. You want a you want a you want a sophisticated ch mm. uh, sense of humor? G. Yeah. K. Yeah. Chesterton. Oh. Now, that, that, that is actually one thing my mother always says. You need to develop a sense of humor, Calder, because she'll tell me a joke and I'll just sit there with uh, the blankest of blank of faces. <laughs> she'll she, she will, she will always say to me, "You're not the son that I used to bring up, Calder. You need to develop a sense of humor again." <laughs> Yeah, you you know, just I I would take, I, I you know I don't I don't mean to sound flippant on this, but <laughs> don't take everything so seriously. Yeah, that does seem to be my problem in all fairness, yeah. Father. Because, because would... just, and and you know what, Saint Saint Thomas Aquinas says this: humor is this. He defines it this way: humor is the the ability to see through things mm. and be pleasantly surprised on the other side. <laughs> just and, and one of the greatest things I, I think I put it in the book too, uh, I, but I believe it. I really believe it is if if you're not able to laugh at yourself, chances are you're missing out on the on the joke of the century. <laughs> I was just about to bring I was just about to bring that up. I saw that on your web page while we were while you were talking earlier. Yeah, yeah. Right. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. And the ability to laugh at yourself requires a little bit of humility and a lot of truth. <laughs> just, that's it. So the, right. I, would give, I would suggest those two things, Calder. Thank you, for. Oh, you said my name correctly. You're the first person, first priest that has ever said my name correctly first time. I'll take All that right. as a sign. Awesome. Take that as a sign. All, All right. right. Um, Josh and, and oh. Gunner, are your questions quick? Because I don't want to hold up Father Murphy. Yeah, it's, yeah. Fairly, it's fairly quick. I don't All right. Uh, then... <laughs> Yeah, paraphrase for me, if you want to, Father. But my question is, and it's kind of funny that Calder actually kind of brought it up a little bit. But what is your opinion on the Society of St. Pius X, ergo uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, and uh, the Vatican II situation? I'll answer it this way. Great question again. Great question. And I'll answer it this way. These are extraordinary times. We are in a real mess. I mean that. I, 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 you, know, you know that it's a big mess. And it, <laughs> there's a possibility of it getting worse before it gets better, which is unbelievable, but it's possible, right? I think, I think that you have to, uh, let's grow up. Let's become adults and look at this. Look at this whole thing. I think the... Cardinal Gagnon, I'll, let me answer it this way. I'll be, I'll be a good diplomat and I'll answer it this way. Cardinal Gagnon, the same Cardinal Gagnon, was also sent later on to investigate by JP2, the Society of St. Pius X. He went to Econ and he wrote me from Econ. I was in Mexico at the time. He came, he came to Mexico right after that. Uh, his comments, and I remember them distinctly, he found Lefebvre, who he already knew, to be saintly. He found Econ to be a model seminary. Model seminary. Not just good, that it was okay, passable. He said, this is a model seminary. It's, it's, it's beautifully run. The curriculum is correct. The spirituality is correct. Everything's correct. I'll stick with Gagnon. That's the report he gave. Now, the reason that Lefebvre did what Lefebvre did, you can investigate it all you want and read about it all you want, is because he did not believe Vatican officials. He didn't believe they were going to be true to what they were promising. You decide whether he was right or wrong. I leave that to you. I've already made up my mind. But I'm not going to tell you what I believe. You might take a guess. All right. Thank, <laughs> thank you so, so much, Father. Right. I actually have to leave. So. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all. Be, be strong in the strength. Uh, uh, joy being with thank you. Thank you very much, Father. God bless <laughs> all right. Father, will you end with your so blessing uh, really quick? Sorry we didn't get to your question, Gunnar. <laughs> Amen. Be strong. Be good men. Be good Catholics. Change the Amen. world. God, God love bless. you. God yes, bless. sir. Awesome. Thank have you so an, have an excellent afternoon, sir.
Don't get those. Father. <laughs> Father, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, okay. I'm gonna be quiet now. Yeah.